<clears throat> Thank you, everyone, for being here today. It's my pleasure to introduce Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin III and Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, General C.Q. Brown, Jr. The Secretary and the Chairman will deliver opening remarks and then have time to take a few questions. Please note that I will moderate those questions and due to time constraints would ask that those called upon limit their follow-ups to give your colleagues a chance to ask their questions. With that, I will turn it over to Secretary Austin, sir. Thanks, Patrick. Good morning, and thanks for being here. I wanted to take just a moment to acknowledge the President's remarks last night, and I want to thank President Biden for being such a strong and skillful guardian of our national security. He will leave an extraordinary legacy of foreign policy achievements, including rallying, rallying the world to save Ukraine from Putin's aggression, uniting and expanding NATO, and positioning America to compete with China and win. I've seen countless times how deeply and personally this Commander-in-Chief cares about our troops, our veterans, and our military families. Now, the President is intensely focused on the work ahead, especially ending, ending the war in Gaza and reinforcing Ukraine's capabilities for the long haul and making our posture in the Indo-Pacific even stronger. And this department will continue to do what we always do, stay firm and stay focused, because we've still got a lot to do. And as we move forward, the entire department salutes the President's life of service. Now, as you all know, it's been a busy time here. We're moving quickly from the historic 75th anniversary uh, NATO summit to my departure tomorrow for my 11th trip to the Indo-Pacific. So since we're in between these two major events and halfway through 2024, I wanted to take a step back, and I wanted to look at the progress that we've made over the past three and a half years, especially when it comes to NATO and the Indo-Pacific. Now, it's worth remembering where we were when I started as Secretary back in 2021. The pandemic was raging, autocrats were emboldened, NATO was divided, and our alliances and partnerships across the Indo-Pacific were frayed. So the Biden-Harris administration came into office determined to restore American leadership and to invest in the greatest fighting force on Earth and to reinforce the global network of allies that makes us stronger and safer. And that's exactly what we've done. And we've shown that American leadership gets results for the American people. Just look at our most important alliance. Today, NATO is larger than ever, stronger than ever, and more united than ever. And over the past three and a half years, we've seen an, an historic increase in annual defense spending across the alliance by almost $80 billion. All NATO allies have agreed to spend at least 2% of their GDP on defense. In 2021, only six allies did so. But in 2024, a record 23 NATO allies will hit the 2% spending goal. And beyond NATO, our bonds with our allies and partners are deep and strong. Putin's outrageous invasion of Ukraine and the tragic Israel-Hamas war have meant sustained communication and consultation with my counterparts, with an intensity that few secretaries of defense have ever matched. I have calls with many of my fellow ministers of defense every week or every month. And the Ukraine contact group, defense contact group that I lead has kept some 50 defense leaders worldwide in close touch at a truly historic tempo. And these frequent touch points have produced vital capabilities for Ukraine. They've also spurred our friends to help shoulder the burden. And they've strengthened America's security. Now, let me talk about what that kind of sustained engagement has meant in the Indo-Pacific, which is our priority theater, priority theater of operations. As you know, I'm wheels up tomorrow morning for important meetings with Secretary Blinken 
and our allies in Japan and the Philippines. Now, I know that it's easy to focus on the crisis of the day, but just look at what our strategy has achieved in the Indo-Pacific over the past three and a half years. We're nearly doubling our military construction investment in the, in the, in the Indo-Pacific from fiscal year 23 to fiscal year 24. And our ties with Australia and India are stronger than ever. We've improved our relationships with Vietnam, Indonesia, Singapore, Papua New Guinea, and many more. In Japan, we're in the process of forward stationing a Marine Littoral Regiment, the most advanced formation in the Marine Corps. And just a few weeks ago, we announced a plan to station our most advanced tactical aircraft in Japan, reflecting more than $10 billion of capability investments. And meanwhile, Japan is making historic investments in its defense spending. And Japan and the ROK are taking some truly historic strides forward together. But there's no greater example of our progress in the Indo-Pacific than the Philippines. When I started as secretary, our ties with the Philippines were at a low point. We were even on the brink of losing our decades-old Visiting Forces Agreement. But after three years of intensive engagement and partnership, we are in an entirely new chapter of our alliance. Last year, President Marcos agreed to include four new locations under our Enhanced Defense Cooperation Agreement. We've expanded our rotational access thanks to the leadership of President Marcos and Secretary Teodoro. And we're taking unprecedented steps to help modernize the Philippine military. So I very much look forward to going back to the Philippines and to Japan. I visited both countries just last year. In Tokyo, Secretary Blinken and I will hold a 2 plus 2 meeting with our Japanese allies. And in Manila, we'll hold another 2 plus 2 with our counterparts from the Philippines. Again, I'm very proud of America's historic achievements with these great allies over the past three and a half years. And it's amazing what the United States, Japan, and the Philippines have done together in just the past six months. With Japan, we've made significant improvements to our force posture. We've also worked more closely than ever with the Republic of Korea. And I'm proud that Minister Kihara and I will sit down in Tokyo with Minister Shin for an historic trilateral defense ministerial, the first ever to be held in Japan or the ROK. All of this just underscores the new convergence in the Indo-Pacific that I talked about in Singapore last month. We're not just strengthening our bilateral alliances, we're also seeing our regional partners come together like never before around our shared vision of a free, open, and secure Indo-Pacific. So it's going to be a great trip, and we're going to deliver even more progress. And with that, I'll turn it over to General Brown. Well, thank you, uh, Secretary Austin. Uh, good morning, everyone. On a warm day, uh, October day in 1937, uh, Franklin, uh, President Franklin Roosevelt addressed a crowd on the Outer Bridge Drive in Chicago. And he said, those who cherish their freedom must work together for the triumph of law and moral principles in order that peace, justice, and confidence may prevail in the world. President Roosevelt knew that we could not turn a blind eye to nations who violate treaties, international law, and the sovereignty of their neighbors. He knew that unchecked aggression only leads to more aggression. Our national defense strategy lays out five key challenges. The People's Republic of China, Russia, Iran, North Korea, and violent extremists. All five of these challenges are active today, and they're increasingly interconnected. The PRC is undermining the international order, uh, using economic coercion, military buildup, technolo technology advancements to challenge our interests and those of our allies. Russia continues its aggression with its war in Ukraine. Iran persists in its malign and destabilizing activities across the Middle East. North Korea remains a significant threat with its continued development of nuclear weapons and ballistic missiles. And violent extremists continue to exploit ungoverned spaces, fragile states, threatening regional, <coughs> regional and global stability. These increasingly interconnected threats demand a coordinated and strategic response from the international community. And importantly, we must leverage all the strengths 
and capabilities of the United States and of, of our allies and partners. Our most valuable uh, strategic advantage is that we never fought alone. From the very founding of our nation, when the French military assisted 13 upstart colonies in gaining their independence, to the beaches of Normandy, to the coalition to defeat ISIS, our battlefield successes have depended on integrating military power with like-minded nations. Due to the complex security environment, we need to redouble our efforts today to collaborate and cooperate with allies and partners. We can't develop our respective national plans and capabilities with allies and partners as an afterthought. We must start at the beginning uh, with the end in mind. We need to be integrated by design. And over the course of the past month, I've had the uh, opportunity to visit several allies and partners around the world to underscore our desire to work in concert and coordinate closely with one another. At the end of June, I went to Botswana to attend the African Chiefs of Defense Conference the first time that conference was held on African soil. Two weeks ago, as the uh, Secretary Hallett, we, we were privileged to uh, celebrate the 75th anniversary of the Washington Treaty at the NATO summit here in Washington, D.C. Thirteen allies came together to celebrate 75 years of peace. We reaffirmed our commitment to collective defense and our shared values of democracy and the rule of law. Russia hoped their invasion of Ukraine would fracture and weaken NATO. Our alliance is stronger and more unified than ever. We've expanded and welcomed Finland and Sweden, and we continue increasing collective capability and operability, furthering improving the history's longest and most successful alliance. The NATO Summit also included leadership from Japan, Republic of Korea, Australia, and New Zealand, demonstrating that our collective security is not limited to one region or one continent. Security in one region contributes to security in another, which is why last week I traveled to the Philippines and Japan to meet with key leaders and strengthen multilateral relationships in the Indo-Pacific region. I had the opportunity to meet my counterpart and other officials in the Philippines, and we held a historic meeting of, of Chiefs of Defense of the Republic of Korea and Japan uh, in Tokyo for the first ever tri uh, meeting in Northeast Asia. Our work with these allies is critical to maintaining stability in the Indo-Pacific and to counter growing influence by the PRC. In route to the Indo-Pacific region, I also visited the Ted Stevens Center for Arctic Security Studies in Anchorage, a DOD regional center that addresses strategic implications of current and emerging Arctic security challenges. On a related note, the Department of Defense released its 2024 Arctic strategy uh, this past Monday. That strategy uh, lays out the steps we will take to safeguard the Arctic, defending our homeland, and keeping the region stable and secure. The strategic security of the Arctic must be intentionally thought through today to determine what capability and capacity will be needed in the future. Whether in the Arctic or the Indo-Pacific regions or in, uh, in Africa, navigating and evolving security challenges depends on integrating and collaborating closely with our allies and partners. Because President Roosevelt's words hold an enduring truth, those who cherish freedom and peace must stand united. Progress will not always be swift. But if the past 75 years have taught us anything, it's that achieving a stable, just, and prosperous world requires the work of all of us. Our alliances and partnerships are our greatest strengths, and together we will continue to build a safer, more peaceful world. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you both, gentlemen. First question will come from Associated Press, Lita <coughs> Bagor. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Secretary. Russian and Chinese bombers were off uh, Alaska yesterday. I'm wondering if you could talk to us about what threat you think that growing cooperation uh, is to the U.S. and also particularly to the allies in Asia who were very concerned the, uh, with this growing activity. And for you, uh, Mr. Chairman, the, um, the President himself expressed some disappointment in the peer and the aid that it was um, able to bring into Gaza. Now that that is gone, what, if any, military involvement do you see, U.S. military involvement, do you see as necessary or not in helping to get continued aid into that area where obviously Palestinians are still starving? Uh, thanks, Leah. Regarding uh, the Russian and Chinese aircraft that flew together um, uh, in the north um, here recently, um, this was not a surprise to us. We uh, closely monitored uh, 
Uh, these aircraft uh, tracked the aircraft, intercepted the aircraft, uh, and uh, which demonstrates that our you know our forces are at the ready all the time, and we have uh, we have very good uh, surveillance uh, capabilities, and and of course I won't discuss any intelligence uh, issues here at the podium, uh, but. Um, Again, it's the first time that we've seen these two countries fly together uh, uh, like that. Uh, they didn't, uh, they didn't um, enter our airspace. Uh, I think the closest point of approach was about 200 miles off, the, off of our uh, uh, coast. So, uh, but this is a thing that, uh, that we track very closely. We're able to intercept. And, it, and if it happens again, if there's any kind of a challenge from, from any direction, uh, I have every confidence that uh, that uh, Northcom and NORAD uh, will will be at the ready and will be able to intercept. In terms of the relationship between uh, Russia and China, this is a, a relationship that we have been concerned about throughout. Most um, um, mostly because we're concerned about China providing uh, uh, support to Russia's uh, illegal and unnecessary war in Ukraine. And we've seen evidence of, of that, uh, and uh, we would hope that uh, that would uh, that would cease going forward. Uh, but uh, but again, um, um, we'll see what happens and how this relationship continues to to develop. Uh, we will we'll remain focused on protecting the homeland here. And again, I applaud the efforts of Northcom and our great airmen, uh, who are always at the ready. Let me just echo the applause, uh, really, for the. Uh nearly 1,000 service members that, that operated J-LOTs uh, over the course of uh, since the time they've been uh, operating there in, in, the, uh, in the Mediterranean. And so uh, what I would tell you is that the, uh, the 20 million pounds of, uh, of humanitarian assistance to, to help the citizens of Gaza, um, you know, we continue to, uh, we moved all that forward. At the same time, the uh, elements that we would be able to put in place, some of the coordination elements um, and uh, the flow from Cyprus, the uh, also the uh, the ground uh, uh, movement through uh, Jordan. Uh, many of those things we'll continue to work on. And so the coordination elements that were put in place that will uh, continue to sustain and support uh, as we transition um, this capability of humanitarian assistance uh, through other means, whether it's through land means through Jordan, but also through the Port of Ashdod there in, in Israel. Okay, next question will go to Fox, Jennifer. Okay. Secretary Austin, just to follow up on the Chinese and Russian warplanes. The Chinese and Russians put out video bragging about this mission, so clearly it was a propaganda effort. The leader of the Houthis also bragged overnight that the drone that struck near the U.S. consulate in Tel Aviv flew 1,400 miles undetected. Are you concerned that the raucous uh, political turmoil and election and the decision of the president to step aside is leading to adventurism and miscalculation by America's adversaries? Are they testing the U.S. right now? And General Brown, yesterday Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu said he wants the U.S. to deliver weapons to Israel faster. He also said that the ratio of civilian casualties to Hamas combatants killed in Gaza is the lowest in the history of urban warfare. <coughs> is that true? Uh, thanks, Jennifer. Um, as to whether or not our uh, adversaries are testing us at this particular time, they're always testing us, and and uh, uh, that's no surprise uh, to any of us. We uh, we see activity in the north uh, uh, on a number of occasions, and we are always at the ready to uh, to address that activity. Uh, and uh, uh, in terms of the Houthis, um, as you know, they have uh, they've been focused on uh, um, successfully uh, launching an attack on uh, on Israel. Uh, and this uh, this one drone that that uh, that was able to get through uh, is uh, is is something that uh, it happened. But uh, but again, uh, it did it uh, when, when you consider the fact that they have tried to attack Israel some 200 plus times, uh, and and this one got through. Um, I think it's it speaks to the remarkable air defenses that uh, that Israel uh, has. But but again, we will see challenges from adversaries uh, throughout. And I don't, I don't think that um, this particular point in time uh, is, uh, is it, it any different. I think uh, we'll continue to see this going forward. Um, it's just uh, the nature of, uh, of who they are and, and what they do. But again, we have the world's uh, greatest military, most, uh, 
most capable military, and we will continue to protect this nation. Uh, General, I'll tell you, we've, uh, as, a, as a nation and uh, as a military, we've uh, provided capability for Israel to, to defend itself uh, before 7 October, but also after 7 October. And after 7 October, we rushed uh, a number of uh, capabilities into uh, uh, to, to the Israelis, save uh, recently one uh, shipment of 2,000-pound uh, weapons. And we'll continue to support uh, with the, the Israelis with, uh, with munitions. Uh, to the Prime Minister's comments on uh, the ratio, uh, you know, I've not seen the numbers to uh, you know, validate or invalidate what he said. But I will tell you, in every one of my conversations with my counterpart, I, I do talk about the aspect of uh, minimizing the and casualties and pushing humanitarian assistance into, uh, into Gaza as they conduct their military operations. So you're not withholding or slowing weapons to Israel right now? We're not. Okay, let's go across the room here to Washington Post. <clears throat> Uh, gentlemen, thanks for your time today. Uh, Mr. Secretary, uh, the Pentagon for more than a year has been examining uh, what the definition of a Gold Star family should be, uh, and it's an emotional topic for people on, on both sides of the issue. Uh, can you explain where you stand on this issue, uh, whether you support a broader definition that includes not only families of those killed in combat, uh, but also accidents, suicides, uh, and other health crises? Uh, <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, uh, despite efforts uh, to uh, stop the Houthis from, from attack, attacking, uh, global shipping remains mostly stymied uh, in the Red Sea, statistically. Uh, do you ex uh, support expanding those efforts in any way to stop the Houthis? Uh, and why has the current effort not been enough to stop it? Well, thanks for the question. Um, let me begin by expressing my uh, deep condolences to all those families who have, uh, who have lost a loved one, uh, either in combat or, or, or otherwise. Uh, every, uh, every one of our troops is, is special to us, uh, and we cherish, uh, you know, what they bring to the, to the force, and we feel their loss when, uh, uh, when, when we lose them. Uh, this is an important topic, and, and uh, it requires uh, and deserves uh, serious deliberation. And so uh, what we have done is, uh, is taken in, a, a, you know, input from a number of different uh, places, and, uh, and we've consulted uh, a number of different uh, uh, people. And, and so it's, it's going to take us a little bit more time to, to work through this, but we, we'll get it right, and we have to get it right. Uh, it, it's, it's really important. But again, uh, this is important to us. It's also important to the many families uh, who, uh, who are part of our, uh, our, our larger family here. So. As we work in the, uh, in the Red Sea and the uh, and involvement in dead, uh, we're working not just uh, you know, with the U.S., but also with the uh, international community and with our allies and partners to ensure the uh, freedom of navigation and the flow of commerce. Um, there's still flow of commerce that goes through uh, the Red Sea and uh, the involvement in dead. But as you as you highlight, the uh, the Houthis are uh, uh, challenging uh, the ability for that to, to move through. Um, we are taking away uh, capability from the Houthis. We'll continue to take away uh, in the approach we're taking uh, capability away from the Houthis. But at the same point, uh, it's going to take more than just a military uh, operation. And, and this is an engagement with the the international community, but also the interagency to use uh, the various tools to put pressure on the Houthis uh, to cease this. They originally tied this in support of the Palestinians. Um, and you, you've watched how they've uh, have changed that. We'll, we'll see how this progresses uh, forward. If you know, if a ceasefire does uh, come to uh, fruition in the uh, hostage deal, um, you know, that'll be a test of whether or not the, the Houthis are, are focused on the Palestinians or the Houthis are focused on the Houthis. Uh, Mr. Secretary, um, as you know, the, uh, the Pen Pentagon recently withdrew uh, its recommendation on that Gold Star issue uh, to review it more. Uh, do you anticipate we will see uh, a firm recommendation out of the Pentagon uh, by the end of the year, by the end of the uh, presidential term, any of the above? I, I won't provide any predictions on a date. Uh, again, what's most important is that that we put uh, we get this right, and we and we take on uh, all of the uh, the recommendations, and we consider you know the, every aspect of this issue. Uh, and uh, when we when we're ready to provide that recommendation, we'll certainly do that. So. Okay. Again, we do have limited time, so I appreciate your. Uh, limiting your follow-ups. Let's go to Al Arabia. Joseph. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Secretary, just to follow up on uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu's comments yesterday, 
that he's, you know, he said that he wanted to fast track, he wanted U.S. weapons fast track. He said that this would lead to a quicker end to the war in Gaza. Your former top official who departed just in January on Middle East policy said that the faster delivery of U.S. weapons to Israel will not enable a faster end to the war. There's no end to the war if the ends are total victory or only defined in military terms. Can you say whether you agree with that assessment or not? And uh, General, I uh, wanted to ask about the Houthis again. There's been some criticism in recent days and weeks uh, from U.S. military officials, including from the CENTCOM commander, about the, uh, the, the U.S.-led mission to counter the Houthis, that maybe the current mission is, is not succeeding. Um, can you talk about any recommendations that you've made that the administration has not heeded or listened to, or what more could be done other than you mentioned uh, more than just military operations or, or related matters. What else could be done specifically? Thank you. Uh, thanks for the question. Um, regarding the speed of delivery of, of uh, security assistance to Israel, uh, we have provided uh, uh, security assistance to Israel at record pace, uh, and we've done that from the very beginning. And we're able to do that because we learned a lot of lessons in uh, from our efforts to provide security assistance to to Ukraine, uh, and uh, and you saw uh, what what happened initially. You know, uh, this conflict. Uh, well, the Israelis were attacked. Uh, a couple of days later, you know, we had uh, we had security assistance flowing in on uh, on the airfield there to uh, uh, to our, our our allies there in Israel. Uh, we have sustained that throughout, and uh, you know, again. We're going to continue to do that. We're going to continue to ensure that Israel has what it needs to defend itself. Uh, but again, in terms of uh, the Prime Minister's comments, I, I, I won't comment on that. What I will tell you is I'm going to stay focused on doing what we've done to date, uh, providing Israel what, what it needs to be successful. So. Well, I'll just tell you I'm not going to get into internal deliberation discussions and tell you what recommendations I made or didn't make or what was taken or not taken. Um, but I will say is that what we are doing is actually uh, taking away uh, a capability from the Houthis from a military aspect. But uh, to be able to address this, it's going to it's going to take broader than just the uh, uh, just the uh, military uh, strikes. Um, there's an inspection regime of, uh, of things that uh, is uh, of smuggling that we can uh, we'll work through. There's also uh, other things that, uh, from a sanction standpoint and, and many of the tools that you're probably familiar with. And that's the conversation of the things that we need to do, not just with the U.S., but just in the international community, and to raise the awareness of uh, the impact of, uh, you know, there is the flow of navigation now, but there is an impact. And so how do we uh, collectively, internationally, look at this so we can get that free flow of commerce back through uh, the Red Sea and the involvement in debt? Okay, let's go to NBC. Thanks. Um, Mr. Secretary. When and how did you find out that President Biden was deciding not to run? I guess could you just when, how, and by who or whom? I'm not sure actually what that is. Who, by whom? Did you find out that he was stepping down? Have you spoken with him since or the vice president since? And, and can you give us any sense of like, I, I know you're not going to want to give us transcripts or quotes from any meetings that you've had that the vice president has participated in, but in some of these bigger decisions that have happened as you've been secretary, like the withdrawal from Afghanistan, strikes against the Houthis, can you give us any sense of the role that the vice president has played in those meetings, like your impressions? Um, uh, and General Brown, you mentioned at the top that there are still active challenges today, including or, or, um, including violent extremists. So I wonder, with this talk about the potential for the, bio, the mission in Iraq to change and the U.S. military presence there to really decrease by a significant amount in the coming year or so, what is the U.S. military assessment for ISIS in Iraq and Syria and, and how they could reconstitute over what timeline? Please. Thanks, Courtney. Uh, I, I found out uh, uh, when the president made the announcement. Uh, this is a very, uh, this is a significant issue, a very personal issue for the president, and uh, he made his decisions on his own timeline. And uh, um, in terms of whether or not I've spoken with him or seen him, um, we were to, we were in the same uh, NSC meeting yesterday, uh, and uh, and then I spoke with him uh, again separately by phone. Uh, so, um, again, I think the president has uh, done a significant amount for uh, for this country and the inter international community, and uh, I am absolutely uh, convinced that he is committed to 
uh, doing everything he can for as long as he can uh, to build upon many of the successes that you heard me talk about earlier today. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I think uh, in terms of uh, this, your second question was about uh, Vice President Harris and her contribution to um, decision making processes. You know, I won't. Uh, I'm, I won't get involved in any kind of political commentary or political processes, but what, what I will tell you is what I know. Uh, having uh, sat in meetings with her for three and a half years, uh, having observed uh, you know, her provide input to some very complex decision-making processes, uh, she is always prepared. She, is always, uh, um, she always provides uh, meaningful and, uh, and very helpful uh, input. Uh, and uh, and again, um, I've seen her help help, uh, help the team, help the president work through some very very complex issues. As uh, as you know, a, the uh, the president's the ma major player in the process, but she is uh, you know she is a key player. So uh, and and again, has always been engaged and involved, is always prepared uh, to uh, for whatever discussion that we're going to have. Uh, she's represented this country in the international arena on the international stage uh, a number of times and done so in a very, very uh, uh, professional and effective manner. Uh, she, uh, um, she's met with key leaders you know, around the globe. She even met with President Xi. And, and so uh, she understands, uh, you know, national security, uh, international affairs, uh, and again, she's been a, a vital asset to the overall team throughout this. Uh, again, that's what I know from uh, sitting in a room with her over three and a half years. So. I didn't mean to limit you. If you did want to give quotes or transcripts from meetings, you could do that. <laughs> I was just trying to. <laughs> sure, see me later. I'll. Uh, <laughs> yeah. That's on the record. Yeah. <laughs> hey, thanks, Courtney. On the uh, questions regarding ISIS, you're probably aware that we had uh, uh, Iraqi partners here the, uh, this week to uh, talk about the uh, transition from Operation Here Resolve to the bilateral security relationship. And I had a chance to sit down with my counterpart and uh, and talk uh, a bit about that transition, but also talk about the security environment and the in relation to ISIS. I'm not gonna, I can't predict for you, uh, you know, what might happen, but we are both focused on making sure there's not a resurgence of ISIS. And so as we make that transition, um, it, it's something, a topic that we, uh, we did talk about and uh, how we posture ourselves from the uh, U.S. military, how we work the bilateral relationship and where the Iraqi security forces are, uh, where it's, you know, very broadly. Now, we'll, we'll continue to work through the details of how that transition and a uh, number of forces, but, uh, you know, we, we both understand the importance of us working together to ensure that there's not a, a resurgence of ISIS. Okay, let's go to Reuters. Idris. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, let's start off with you. Um, can you just give us a sort of broader assessment of Israel's military strategy in Gaza? Mm -hmm. It seems there's sort of a clear and then not hold which allows Hamas to come back in areas. How do you see, is that a sustainable strategy? And um, have you seen a credible day after plan from the Israelis so far? And Mr. Secretary, you mentioned uh, Vice President Harris being a key player. Could you give an example of when you've seen that? And then personally for you, what are you hoping to achieve in the, six, in, in the remaining six months? And looking back at your tenure, um, you know, what do you see as your legacy? And what's, what's your biggest regret that you've had um, in, in the past three, three and a half years? Um, in, in terms of uh, specific examples of Vice President Harris's input to um, decision-making processes, we'd, we'd go back to the same place that uh, Courtney was trying to get me to there to, to provide uh, 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 information of the, uh, that, that we uh, uh, dealt with uh, in, that, in that process, and I'm not going to do that. Uh, but what I will tell you is that uh, if you just kind of look at the things that we have done, Idris, over, over the past three and a half years, uh, you know, the strikes that we've had to take, the, uh, the deployments that we've done, the, uh, uh, the decision to, uh, uh, to support uh, Ukraine, you know, it, it, there's just thing after thing after thing. Uh, she's always there. She's always a part of the process, and she's always very engaged. And the one thing that I would also tell you is that that she absolutely loves troops, and uh, and and 
you know, she comes from uh, the state of California, where, as you know, there are a lot of troops uh, in that in that state, and so she's always been focused on uh, the welfare of uh, of our of our troops and our families, and and also uh, veterans as well. Um, so that that's what I know, and uh, and again, she has been uh, thoroughly engaged throughout. And what was the second part of your question? Well, what, you, what do you see as your legacy in this job? And what's your biggest regret in the past three and a half years? You've had successes, but naturally also some uh, yeah, failures, frankly. But yeah, what's your biggest regret? You know, Idris, uh, if, if my staff heard me talk about my legacy, they would have a heart attack because they know that I never focus on my legacy. I'm focused on uh, defending this country, taking care of our people, uh, and making sure that we have what we need to uh, to do those things and and, uh, and again I think as long as we're doing the kinds of things that we we are doing and have done um, the legacy issue will take care of itself again if you look around I mean there's a lot of points on the board and uh, you know if you're if it's a fact it, it's not bragging it's just it's just a fact I mean you look at what I mentioned earlier, what we've done with the Philippines and, and throughout the Indo-Pacific, you look at the fact that uh, NATO is uh, is more unified than it's than it's ever been, uh, you know, and, and it goes on and on and on. I think I think this team has done remarkable work, um, and I mention a team because it is all about the team. Uh, we have some of the greatest uh, and most talented professionals here on the OSD staff that uh, that I've ever had the chance to work with and of course you know the kind of the caliber of people we have on a joint staff but our troops are out there doing amazing things every day and whatever successes we've achieved is because of them and because of the great families that support them so we have work left to do and uh and we're going to stay focused on that work you know we got ukraine and russia we got you know israel and gaza uh and uh, and, and we have to continue to make sure that we maintain a competitive edge in the Indo-Pacific. So, I'm sorry? Biggest regret in the past three and a half years? I'll tell you what my biggest, uh, uh, what, what I'm grateful for most is having the ability to, 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 uh, to, to, to serve with the kinds of people that I just described. So, yeah. to, uh, to answer your question, it, you know, uh, you know, Israelis are operating in a, a very complex uh, uh, urban environment with an extensive uh, tunnel network. And so, uh, you know, from a strategy standpoint, I pretty defer to them exactly, you know, their, their, their strategy. But, you know, being able to go in and, and clear out areas and, and, uh, and, and being able to try to hold that at the same time uh, uh, as Hamas is able to use that subterranean uh, uh, features to, to move around uh, does create some challenges. As far as the day after, um, you know, I, we have talked to the Israelis about this, uh, how, how to, to make a transition. Uh, we've talked to them a number of different times. You know, the, there's not a lot of detail that I've uh, been able to see from a uh, plan from them, and that this is something we'll continue to uh, work with them on. Um, and we could, cause it's going to be important for the security of the region of, of how you work that day after, as well as we work and talk to some of the other nations, uh, uh, partners in the region as well. Okay, we have time for one more. We'll go to Charlie, CBS. Thank you. Uh, first of all, Mr. Secretary, as we understand it, this is the first intercept of a joint Chinese-Russian exercise in that region. What message are they trying to send and why now? And General, if I could ask you about the pier. A lot of these conditions would have been predicted and forecasted for the challenges. Many people say that it wasn't designed for what it was meant to do. So what went wrong? In terms of the message that the Russians and the Chinese are sending, I'll tell you what message we're sending. And that message is we're going to be at the ready. We are at the ready. We will always be at the ready. We're going to defend this nation. And so if there, is a, if there is a challenge or a threat to, uh, to the United States of America, your troops will be at the ready, and they will do the right thing. And I want to thank uh, all those who continue to support our troops and their families. Uh, what you saw the other day is, is what they do each and every day, and I am absolutely proud of them. What, what do you think of the timing? Why now? It's, it, well, I mean, you, you could probably guess that things like that have – probably been planned well in advance. Uh, and so um, that, that certainly would be my guess. Uh, and, and t in terms of why they would choose to do something at a particular time, you know, I, I have to ask them. But what I'll tell you is that 
whenever uh, somebody uh, does uh, something like that, we'll be at the ready to do the right thing. Charlie, we uh, as we uh, did the plan for uh, moving the uh, jail lots to the pier, and uh, one of the things, there's a couple things we uh, we knew that we, we did plan for. We knew this would be temporary. We also knew that the sea states would start to increase as you got further into the summer, and uh, and, and so from that perspective, we, we did everything we you know we could to help mitigate. And uh, as you saw, we bring the pier in, we move it back out, so we can preserve the capability to continue to push uh, humanitarian assistance in uh, to the citizens of Gaza. Again, I'm very proud of the uh, you know thousand service members that were were doing the, uh, this work because it's it's not easy work, and uh, to be able to provide uh, humanitarian assistance, um, I thought was you know I think we all collectively believe it was important uh, to support and get that energized, uh, not just what we did but what the others were able to do because of the uh, you know uh, us being able to energize the, the the process. But it was hoped it would be more effective. Well, I mean, we didn't come out with the metrics and say, here's how much we're going to move or how, how many days. But, uh, you know, I, I think it was effective. And, uh, you know, uh, you know, what we did is better than not doing anything at all and just observing. And, and, and again, I think we, we did a good job of actually getting things energized. And, um, um, and ideally, as we get ready to bring the J-Lots home, we'll continue to be able to, to uh, you know, help with the coordination piece now that we've got some of that coordination done. And, and continue that flow of humanitarian assistance into Gaza. I mean, we're talking 8,800 metric tons of humanitarian assistance. You know, if you're if you're a person in uh, in Gaza starving to death, I think that's effective. And and uh, and again, as the chairman said, this was never designed to be a permanent fix. And I made that point from the very beginning, and I made it every day that uh, this is a temporary. Uh, um, measure that we're taking uh, to uh, help with the overall effort and uh, we're, we're going to take it out at the at the end of July so um, but while we you know when we had the opportunity to provide humanitarian assistance I think our, our troops did amazing work amazing work so. thank you very much ladies and gentlemen that concludes our press briefing Secretary Austin General Brown thank you, thank you.